Welcome back to the channel everyone and thank you for joining me and welcome to Tilbury Fort on the River Thames. Tilbury Fort is one of the finest surviving examples of 17th century military engineering in England. Originally built during the reign of King Henry VIII to protect the dockyards of Woolwich and Deptford. At the time, it was a much smaller Tudor fort defending the River Thames against enemy ships. Interestingly, it was in nearby West Tilbury that Elizabeth I famously rallied her makeshift army awaiting the Armada in 1588. Our plan today is to explore the fort and learn a little bit about one particular event in history, the Jacobite Rebellion and the part that this formidable fort played in it. The history of the Jacobites is something that intrigues me a lot as my seventh great-grandfather, James Gordon Esquire of Caberdy, Aberdeenshire, was a Jacobite himself and a close friend of Bonnie Prince Charlie. The young Prince Charlie even gifted James Gordon a silver pocket watch chain once owned by Mary, Queen of Scots. The item has since been returned to the Royal Collection and on display at Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh. So how does Tilbury Fort play a role in the Jacobite Rebellion? Well, the connection is very dark and associated with the imprisonment, death and execution of many Jacobite prisoners. Today, a Clodden memorial stone can be found on the site, an actual stone brought to London from the bloody battlefield of Culloden. Clodden being the last stand of the Jacobite cause and the last battle ever fought on English soil, it was unveiled on the 16th of July, 1998, and reads, in memory of the Scottish prisoners for the Battle of Culloden in April 1746, who died either on the Thames prison ships or within the fort. The actual names of the Jacobites who died are listed within Tilbury Fort, and we will be taking a look at that as we explore the sites. Who were the Jacobites? The Jacobites' name being derived from the Latin Jacobus, meaning James. They were supporters of James II and his heirs claim to the English throne. Since 1688, when James fled into exile, his supporters kept alive the hope of a Jacobite restoration and with it the return of Catholicism in Britain. There were two short-lived and unsuccessful rebellions, one in 1715 and the other in 1745. Both of these rebellions attempted to restore the Stuarts to the English throne. The old pretender, James Edward Stuart, son of King James II. He arrived in Scotland in 1715 to rise against the authority of King George I. His attempt sadly failed. It is, however, the second rebellion that is most remembered. It was July 1745 and James Edward Stuart sung the young pretender Charles Edward Stuart, known as Bonnie Prince Charlie, returned from exile in France to attempt that second rebellion. It would have disastrous effects for the people of Scotland for many years to come. And here's that stone, everybody, the uh, memorial stone. This giant piece of granite was brought here from Culloden Moor in Scotland. And it says, in memory 
of the Scottish prisoners in the Battle of Culloden in April 1746, who died either on the Thames prison ships or within the fort. The names of the Jacobites who died are listed within Tilbury Fort. With a handful of officers, he soon raised an army of 3,000 to lead that 1745 Scottish rising against the now King George II of England. Within six weeks, he was able to take Edinburgh and on its surrender, Charles proclaimed his father King and continued to rout the English force under Sir John Cope of Preston Pans. However, he did not press home his advantage, but waited in Edinburgh and did not cross the English border until November. This weight may have played a significant part in losing as it gave the English forces time to assemble their army, some 10,000 men, under the command of William, Duke of Cumberland, son of George II. When the huge English army marched into Scotland, Charles was forced to retreat his forces to the Scottish Highlands. It was on the 15th of April 1746 that the two armies met on Culloden Moor and prepared for battle. It was on that battlefield that the superior English force heavily defeated the tired and hungry Jacobite army. William, Duke of Cumberland, ordered that no quarter be given the Jacobites were pursued and cut down without mercy, forcing many to flee in exile, including my own seven times great-grandfather, James Gordon of Caberdy. As a result, the births of all his children after 1746 were hidden from the authorities and not even recorded in the parish records until some years after the event took place. The Battle of Culloden was the last major battle fought on British soil. After the Battle of Culloden, some 3,470 prisoners had been taken, including men, women and children. It had been decided by the Privy Council in London that the prisoners of the Rising in Scotland should be tried in England, thus demonstrating a total lack of trust in the Scots at that time and the determination to break the back of the rebellion and the Highlanders' course, despite it breaching the Treaty of Union between Scotland and England. The prisoners were mainly taken to Inverness, and on the 10th of June, seven leaky transport ships named Margaret and Mary, Fane of Fife, Jane of Leith, Jane of Alloway, Dolphin, and yet Alexander and James, set sail for England under the escort of HMS Winchelsea. The Duke of Newcastle first required the Savoy Barracks in London to, prepare, to be prepared to accept the prisoners, and then on the 18th of June reported that His Majesty, having been pleased to direct that 300 of the rebel prisoners, which are now on transports in the river, should be carried to Tilbury Fort in order to be kept there until His Majesty's further pleasure shall be known. The first mention of Jacobite prisoners at Tilbury Fort was on the 11th of August, when at least 268 prisoners were landed. A redundant gunpowder magazine building in the southeast bastion of the fort was used as the prison. Other prisoners fared less well and they stayed on the transport ships or prison hulks moored on the river. However, the inhumane conditions brought on cases of typhus and general sickness, and it was agreed the transports could move off station and anchor close to Tilbury Fort so that prisoners could be daily landed for air and may be attended by the apocryphy 
by the 11th of September 1746, the number of prisoners in the fort had dwindled to 223. 45 had died. The Scottish History Society has published in three well-documented volumes, Prisoners of the 45, which lists 3,470 people known to be in custody. Some had played prominent parts in the rising. Others were accused of nothing more serious than that they had been heard to wish the rebels well or to have drunk to the prince's health. Such charges, however, could mean transportation, even death. Prisoners at Tilbury were selected for the trial on the basis of every 20th man. This was decided by lotting, utilising a beaver hat containing 19 white slips and one black slip of paper. It is recorded that 170 prisoners were executed, four of them peers of the realm. They were executed on Tower Hill, including the 80-year-old Lord Lovett, who was the last person to be headed in public in England, beheading being a privilege of their rank. The others suffered the barbaric ritual of hanging, drawing and quartering. The remainder were dealt with in various ways. 936 were transported to the colonies, there to be sold to the highest bidder. 222 were banished, being allowed to choose their country of exile. 1,287 were released or exchanged. Others died escaped or were pardoned, and there were nearly 700 whose fates could not be traced. A number of state papers exist relating to the condition, expenses, administration and disposal of prisoners, as ultimately court proceedings resulted in execution, transportation, deportation, pardons and deaths whilst in, whilst in captivity. During this time, the prison hulks became a bit of a tourist attraction, with the long ferry running trips from Westminster around the Tilbury prison hulks for sightseeing. They were provided with scented handkerchiefs to combat the smell, while later on it was possible to gain entry to Tilbury Fort to view the prisoners. The last recorded prisoner of the 45 Rebellion was released from Tilbury Fort some time after January 1749 or 1750. Today, Tilbury Fort is under the guardianship of the English heritage and is regarded as one of the finest examples of 17th century fortifications in the country. However, remodelling in the 19th and 20th centuries upgraded the gun batteries for continued defence of the cap of the capital has resulted in some of the buildings used for imprisoning the Scottish rebels being destroyed. The original magazine building used as a prison still survives encased within the later redevelopment of the Victorian gun battery in the southeast bastion. Okay everybody, there is actually a famous story about Lord Lovett who was executed at Tower Hill for the part he played in the Jacobite rebellion. It's believed that lots of people came to view his beheading and the platform where they placed him was apparently very unstable. Where that platform was so unstable, legend has it that it actually collapsed, killing a few people who were watching the gross spectacle of his beheading. And he found it so funny but apparently Lord, Laugh, Lord Lovett was even laughing when the axe came down and cutting his head off. It's apparently where the saying comes from, laugh your head off. Now we're going to head in the direction of where the Jacobite prisoners were actually held here at Tilbury Fort. Now I've been told that the area has since been dismantled and covered over by 
during the Victorian period and the area sadly has become unstable due to the soft clay beneath the ground and as a result they have closed off the actual area but we are gonna take a little look as close as we can anyway but first it's an interesting building just here everybody so many interesting rooms Yes, and you can actually see where it's all starting to crack. So you can see why the area has, has actually been cordoned off. But if we head up here, we can take a look at the space. So here we go, everybody. So this is the actual location where Jacobites were actually held after the Battle of Culloden. This actual space here. So there was a tower here or a building and this was actually where the prison was located. Of course they've closed it off because the ground is starting to come apart. And I think this is a really good space to end this video. So a very, very big thank you everybody for joining me here at Tilbury Fort on the River Thames as we learned a little about those Jacobite prisoners that were kept here after the Battle of Culloden. So stay safe everybody and we'll see you all soon. Bye for now. Bye everyone. <laughs>